Hi, let's talk a bit about the evolutionary developmental biology of cave dwelling organisms and the traits that accompany them. And those traits are called troglomorphic traits, traits that tend to evolve when organisms of all types learn and adapt to live in caves where there's no light. So first let's start with the big picture. If a scientist was interested in understanding the genetic basis for the evolution of these traits, like in this case, the trait we're going to focus on, the loss of eyes. So in this particular species of fish that live in central Mexico in caves, a bunch of those different populations of fish have each independently evolved the loss of eye development. So their ancestor was a surface fish, like the one shown here, that develops eyes like we expect most fish to do. But in many cases then, those eyes have been lost. So the eyes never develop or they start to develop, but they don't fully develop. So the big evolutionary developmental biology question here is what are the genetic changes that allow a formerly surface dwelling fish over many generations over evolutionary time to lose eye development? So what sorts of observations we could hope for if we're looking for genetic changes that explain this change? One of the things that we could do is expect to find mutations in genes already known to be involved in eye development, for example. So we don't have to necessarily cast a wide net to understand what those genetic changes might be. We could start, and the authors could start, by looking at genes that are known to be involved in development of eyes and to look for mutations in those genes. And then beyond that, what sorts of mutations might we expect to see? So there are a few different categories. We might expect to find coding region differences and this is true not just for the evolution of eye loss. This is true in general for understanding the genetic basis of evolution, is there tends to be this impetus or principle to look for, to hope to find mutations that change protein sequence. So if a scientist is going to start sequencing some DNA, say between these two populations, both populations, and try to discover if there are specific mutations to the cavefish population. And then they're gonna go on and try to figure out which of those mutations that are unique to cave dwelling fish might be responsible for the evolution of the trait of eye loss. They want to be able to categorize those mutations in some way to decide which mutations to work on first. So often geneticists will focus on mutations that cause changes in coding regions of genes. There are other things though, in addition to protein sequence change, those are some of the easiest mutations to detect and to predict the effects of and to study experimentally the effects of. But we can also have other differences, genetic differences that can cause changes in traits that don't have to do specifically with changing a gene itself, that is the coding region. And I'm not going to provide an exhaustive list, but here are a few other options. So there could be gene expression level changes. In other words, it's not just the sequence of the protein that's produced that's important, but how much of the protein is produced. So if the amount of transcription is related to the amount of translation, which isn't necessarily the case, we might expect that some mutations could cause reduction or increase of gene expression, leading to an increase or decrease in protein production. And maybe that sort of a difference can cause the loss or the gain of a trait. So we can have changes in gene expression level. And then we could also have, likewise, location or timing differences. So DNA mutations or changes in DNA sequence that are found in the promoters or regulators, enhancers, for example, of genes can not only change how much protein is expressed, the amount of transcription, but those changes can also change where in the body those genes are turned on and when during development 
those genes are activated or inactivated. So there are lots of different DNA sequence mutations that can change a lot of different aspects of the central dogma, transcription and translation, that could potentially influence the evolutionary developmental biology of a trait, any trait, not just the loss of eyes. So what we'll talk about in detail today are, I will first introduce the idea of cave dwelling organisms and the cave fish in particular. Talk a bit about quantitative trait locus mapping, just the basics, very basics. Talk about briefly, a really trivial but important point, the distinction between a linkage group and a chromosome. And then I'll end with the concept of pleiotropy. Now, I mentioned already the idea of troglomorphic traits. Those are traits that are found in organisms that move into caves and then live there over many generations so that they evolve traits that are specific to and adaptive to living in caves. So it's often the case that organisms' troglomorphic traits include enhanced hearing, the sense of hearing, loss of eyesight or the loss of any sort of uh, light detection capabilities because there's no benefit to having those sorts of uh, capabilities or senses inside a cave. If there's no light, why would the organism, this is a little bit, um, this is not the correct way to think about this, but if the organism could decide for itself how it was going to evolve, why would it want to waste energy developing structures that are completely useless like eyes? Another way that the um, cave dwelling organisms generally, as you can see here, evolve is they tend also not to produce pigments. So most cave dwelling organisms tend to be what we might consider albino. They're not really, but in some ways they are. They don't produce pigments. So those are all a set of troglomorphic traits. The cave fish that are being studied generally for troglomorphic traits and understanding the evolutionary development of any of those traits that are involved in living in caves tend to be these fish that include the genus Astyanax, which is a fish species. And these fish are found in a series of caves and also surface populations. So rivers where there's light and caves where there isn't light. They tend to be found in a number of these caves and then surface streams and rivers in central Mexico. So this is where these species come from and where these have been studied. And so this is a brief timeline of some important events in the evolution of this genus and the different caves that they inhabit. And the main thing to focus on here is how long these fish have been present in central Northeast uh, Mexico. So you'll notice there was about 8 million years ago when sort of the original stock of a pigeon, and a pigeon means surface dwelling fish, arrived in that part of Mexico. And those caves already existed. So some of those populations then moved into the caves and basically lived there generation after generation for, again, those millions of years. And there was also a second invasion of a pigeon or surface dwelling fish about 2 million years ago. So these fish have had lots of generations to evolve the trogonomorphic traits that they exhibit today. And here's an example of the development of eyes comparing a cave fish to a surface fish. So in each of these panels, the surface fish, a very closely related population, but a population that always lives in the surface and never goes into caves. They begin developing their eye early during larval development and the eye fully develops by adulthood. And again, these are fish that are surface dwelling that live in the light. In populations that have evolved to live in caves, you can compare each developmental stage. Basically, you never see anything that looks like an eye start to form. There is a little bit of eye development, but it's very rudimentary and it doesn't let these fish sense light. So this again is the trait that 
were interested in exploring in evolutionary developmental biology in terms of cave dwelling organisms. What is it? What are the genetic changes that cause populations that have evolved to live in caves to lose eye development? And of course, it's really important to know whether or not any trait is caused by nature or nurture. For example, it could be, although I can't think immediately of a reason why, it could be that something about nutrition would cause eyes not to develop. So there are some experiments that scientists could do to test whether or not the loss of eye development in the cave fish is caused by evolution. That is, does it have a genetic basis? So some easy things to do, which scientists have done, would be to do things like move the fish out of the caves, rear them in aquaria, and feed them well, for example, to sense, get a sense of whether there are environmental conditions that can cause better or worse eye development. These fish have been grown in aquaria and they still don't develop eyes. So that's one piece of information that suggests that eye loss is genetic. But this is the most important experiment that showed that there is definitely a genetic basis, a set of mutations, one or more, that causes eye loss. And that is, if you take each of these abbreviations stands for a different cave fish population. So in this case, the authors are looking at seven different populations of cave dwelling fish that don't develop eyes. And when they cross two individuals, so a male and a female from the same population and look at their offspring, you, we can look at the key. So in, I believe that's the Pachon population, which is one of the most commonly studied uh, populations of cave fish. If you cross a male and a female from that population together, the standard situation is that their offspring develops small internal eyes. As I said, the eyes start to develop, but they don't fully develop. And that's also true for each cross where you have male and female from the same population. So notice that diagonal these fish develop small internal eyes. And then you get different populations where maybe eyes develop a little bit more in these populations. But again, these are all members of the same species, just different populations that have independently by themselves migrated into a cave, just one cave, and they stay there. And that population lives there. So each of these seven populations is in the same species. So you can make them together and produce offspring. But in nature, they would never encounter each other because they never leave their caves, these seven different caves that these populations leave in, live in. So the critical experiment here is what happens if you cross a Pachon cave fish with an RS cave fish? Same species, they produce offspring. Those offspring develop large external functional eyes. In other words, these different cave dwelling populations have distinct sets of mutations that prevent them from fully developing their eyes. But if you combine those different sets of mutations into a hybrid offspring, like a hybrid offspring between Pachon and RS, that set of mutations can complement each other. Because, for example, the RS population might have a wild type version of a gene that's mutant in Pachon. And the Pachon population might have a wild type version of a gene that's mutant in the RS population. So by creating a heterozygous F1 hybrid, you can see that eye development is actually possible in these species. So that is a clever and really elegant and simple way to tell that the loss of eyes really does have a genetic basis and therefore is subject to study and scrutiny in evolutionary development. I want to introduce the concept of genetic mapping. And I'm going to start with a simple explanation, and then we're going to move on to quantitative trait mapping. And I'm going to give an example that isn't exactly a QTL mapping demonstration or cartoon like this one is, but it's sort of close. And I don't want to get too much into detail with this now. I may produce a video in the future that goes into detail about QTL or quantitative trait locus mapping. So let's consider, in this case, a situation where there's one gene in a diploid organism. So there are two copies of the gene in each organism. So an organism is displayed as a box, and the shading of the organism is its trait, in this case, pigment production. 
So if the, there are two versions of this gene A, capital A, which produces some pigment. So that's why this individual is darker than this one. This individual is homozygous capital A. We might alternatively properly in genetics write that capital A slash capital A. That individual has two copies of the capital A gene, two capital A alleles. And so those proteins that are produced by those genes each produce pigment. So let's, for example, consider the case of in Drosophila, if you want a real example of this and not just a cartoon, we might consider that this could be the Drosophila yellow gene, which produces the yellow protein, which is an enzyme that converts a substrate into melanin, a dark pigment. And so if a Drosophila, I don't know if this is true, now this is made up, I suspect this could be the case, but I don't know. But it's useful for this cartoon anyway. If a Drosophila was heterozygous, where they had one copy of the yellow gene and then a mutant version that didn't produce that protein, I would expect on first principles that the Drosophila would produce half as much melanin because only one of the two copies of the gene can produce protein. So there should be maybe half as much protein. So on average, maybe a Drosophila would produce, that's heterozygous, would produce half as much melanin. So maybe it would be lighter colored. It would still produce pigment, but not as much. So let's use that as a sort of example for what might be happening in this cartoon that a homozygote produces a lot of pigment and a homozygote for the lowercase a, let's say that's this sort of mutation from yellow gene. So that individual produces no pigment or very little pigment because say, for example, both copies of that gene don't work, so they don't produce pigment. So what happens if you mate these two individuals together? You get a heterozygote, capital A or lowercase a, so this would be the example, like I suggested here in Drosophila, of an individual that has one good copy or one working copy of the gene and one mutant copy. So they produce half as much pigment as the homozygote did. And if you cross those two individuals together, this is the trick or this is the point of genetic mapping for simple traits. And that's why I'm focusing here on Mendelian factors. We're looking at one gene. This is a trait that in this example is only caused by a single gene. Production of pigment is controlled entirely by the A gene. So in the F1 generation, if you cross two heterozygotes, Mendel's laws and the Punnett square tell us that we expect to see three different phenotypes. The lowercase a over lowercase a individual, like the parent, will produce one trait, no pigment or very little pigment. Then we have the heterozygotes, like their parents, that have one functional and one dysfunctional copy of the gene and the protein. So they produce half pigment. So let's say that was no pigment, half pigment, and then we have one individual regenerated in the F2 generation, like its parent, capital A over capital A, that produces what we'll call full pigment. In other words, if you look in the grandchildren of a cross between two individuals, if there's a simple trait, if the trait you're looking at is only controlled by a single gene and you're looking in a diploid organism, so there can only be two different versions of that gene, then you can get a maximum of three different phenotypes or traits. You get the trait that the homozygote for the recessive allele has, you get the trait that the heterozygote has, and you get the trait that the homozygote dominant has. So that's a maximum of three different traits. And that's why I refer to this as, these are discrete trait values. There are no kind of sort of in between no pigment and half pigment. There's nothing in between half pigment and full pigment. You either have no pigment, half as much pigment as full, or you have the full amount of pigment. So those are discrete traits. You, if you were measuring these individuals, you could really easily tell the three different traits apart. You wouldn't really have to do any measuring in other words, to obtain or to classify individuals into which of those three categories they fit in. Now that is 
counterpoint to what happens in a quantitative trait. So that was a simple trait that we just looked at. Here's an example of a quantitative trait. These are traits that involve multiple genes that all contribute to the same phenotype or trait that we can observe. And for that reason, instead of binary traits or three traits or discrete traits like we just saw, three different categories of pigmentation with no intermediates, just those three, if there are multiple genes that are all involved in producing the trait that you're looking at, then you don't get those three discrete traits. You get a continuum, a distribution of various types of traits. So again, in the pigmentation version, instead of one gene controlling the trait, just gene A, like we just saw, what if there are three different genes, genes A, B, and C? So an individual that, are, that is at the extreme of this pigment spectrum could have the recessive versions at all three, homozygous recessive for all three of those genes, produces no pigment like we saw in the previous example. And then somebody who has the darkest pigmentation or the most pigmentation could be homozygous dominant for all of the alleles at those three genes. And then just like we saw before, these are still similar. When you create an F1 hybrid, then each, they're heterozygous in each of those three genes. So once again, the F1s produce an intermediate trait. But now what happens when we mate those two F1s and look at the F2 generation? Now, as you can see, this is entirely based on Mendel's laws and the Punnett square. When you're looking instead of one gene at three different genes, when you have two genes, or two alleles rather, at three genes, that's two to the third power or eight different combinations that of, of gametes that each of the parents can produce. And those are what are described on the column headings and the left of each of the rows. And so when you multiply eight by eight, you get this 64 square table that are all, well, mostly all different combinations of genotypes that the F2 grandchildren can have. Now, some of them are similar, like for example, this square here and this square here, those are the same genotype. They're heterozygous at the first gene and they're homozygous recessive for the second and the third gene. So there are, that's why I'm saying these are not 64 different genotypes, but there are more than three different genotypes like we saw in the previous example. So there are going to be more than three different traits there are gonna be more than three different levels of pigmentation, which we can see here. So it looks like they've shown that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different levels of phenotypes based on how many of the dark or wild type alleles are in that individual. So you can have zero, one, two, and so forth. Three, four, five, and the full six. So in this case, we expect six different or maybe seven different, if we count the individual that has no copies of any of those wild type dominant genes, we get seven different pigmentation traits. And of course, then the more genes that are involved in one of these traits, the more different categories of trait can be produced. Thus, this produces what is harder for scientists to study is a set of continuously varying trait values. We no longer have the situation where it's easy to go out and identify a single individual and know really for sure, really absolutely, which of these different categories they fit in. We have to do some very careful measurements of pigmentation in this case to classify an individual as which of these different pigment categories they belong to. So the process of identifying all of those different genes that are involved in a, producing a quantitative trait like pigmentation, one of the goals here is to figure out, well, where are those genes? What are the genes? Where are they located in the genome? And the way that works is this process called quantitative trait locus or QTL mapping. The first step is to select a large number of hybrids, hybrid individuals 
and then carefully measure the quantitative trait, like pigmentation, like we were just looking at. So you get very precise measurements of a trait that you're interested in studying from a large number of independent hybrid organisms or individuals. So in this case, what we're looking at is a set of cell layers, distinct cell layers that are present in the eyes of these fish. And so in this previous study, this is not the study that we're looking at presently, a previous cavefish study, they looked at the thicknesses of the different cell layers in these different um, populations of cavefish. So these, the thicknesses of the cell layers are quantitative traits. You can measure how thick each of those cell layers is with a micrometer or some other tool. And so that's a, conti a continuous or quantitative trait. There are not discrete thicknesses of cell layers. There's a continuous scale variation. So that's what these authors did. They wanted to know where are the genes in the genome that control or that regulate the thicknesses or the abundance of these different cell layers during eye development. So this is sort of an example, this is an example, this is sort of what the data look like. Each of these columns represents a single hybrid individual or single individual. And so they've color coded the thickness of those seven different cell layers and then they've stacked them on top of each other. So these are essentially visual representations of the total thickness of the eye, with the thickest eyes being on the right and the thinnest eyes being on the left. And then you can see relative from one individual to another, how relatively thick the different cell layers are. So for example, I think this is ret retinal pigment epithelium. It isn't present in all fish. It's present in some fish, but you can see there's a lot of variation between individuals even that have this, and that that's a continuously varying trait, as are all of these different traits. So that's the next step. First step, collect individuals, measure traits. This is the next step in QTL mapping to make sure that the traits that you're studying really are quantitative. So you produce a plot like this to make sure that you've got measurements of all different sizes, that it doesn't appear that these traits are binary, that there are one or two or maybe three different categories that you could bin or sort individuals into. So after you get the measurements from the individuals, then you genotype those individuals. These days we would sequence the full genomes probably of all of those individual hybrids that were measured. And then we use a computer, and this is the part that I'm not going to go into detail about because I'm not a QTL, I'm not a quantitative geneticist, I don't do QTL mapping, so I'm not an expert in this. But I'm going to show you an example in just a minute that's kind of like quantitative trait locus mapping. It'll at least give you the idea of what the computer does when the scientist feeds all of the quantitative trait measurements into the computer and all of the genotypes of all of those individuals that they measured. And they use the computer to look for associations where a particular combination of genotypes at two loci or three loci or more, that's why it's called quantitative trait locus mapping. They can look, it looks for more than two sets of genes at a time or more than two loci at a time and tries to figure out where are there genes or regions of the genome that every time a fish, in this case, has a particular thickness of cell layer, it always has this particular genotype at that particular spot in the genome. Oh, and by the way, also this different genotype, but the same genotype over here on a different chromosome in a different region, region of the genome. This is not something that can be done by hand. It really has to be done by computers. So here's an example of sort of not quite QTL, a quantitative trait locus mapping. It's a reasonable proxy for how this works, but it's not QTL mapping. And here's the setup. So we have a diploid individual with a, a, one parent, or one individual has very few trichomes or hairs on the leaves. And its genotype is homozygous red. So we're using red to indicate uh, genetic differences between the two parents. So the blue chromosomes provide this trait for the second parent. They have a lot of pairs on the leaf. So as we just saw, and this doesn't mean that this is a quantitative trait, and that's why this isn't quantitative trait mapping. This is more an example of a complex trait. 
that would be a trait that's controlled by more than one locus, so two or more loci. And that is what quantitative trait locus mapping is meant to identify, is the locations of multiple genes that control a trait. The difference here is this trait itself that I'm showing you is actually a binary trait because the individuals either have, well, it's a trinary trait. They either have few, leave, few hairs, lots of hairs, or an intermediate number. So that is the reason that this isn't an example of QTL mapping. This is mapping more like a um, complex trait in that what I'm about to show you is it's controlled by two genes, which is the same as what QTL mapping looks for, two or more genes. So back to the story. The F1 individual has an intermediate number of pairs on its leaf and it's hybrid. So then the F1 is selfed or crossed to another F1 to produce the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. In this example, they've gone to the F8 or the eight hybrid generation and they've now collected the individuals that are in that generation. So here we've got 10 different individuals and their traits, very few hairs or lots of hairs on the leaves. And again, if this was QTL mapping, there would be a huge variation in the number of hairs, but the analysis would proceed just like I'm about to describe. So what we want to know, if we want to figure out what gene controls few hairs versus lots of hairs on the leaves. We want to look for a region of the genome, and remember red, in, red stands for one genotype, blue stands for another genotype. We want to find a spot in the genome where the F8s that have very few hairs, one, two, three, four, have a genotype that's like parent one. So in other words, we're looking for red, because we think that red controls few hairs and blue controls lots of hairs. So we want to look for a region on the chromosome where every individual that doesn't have a lot of hairs has a red genotype. And every individual that has lots of hairs has a blue genotype. So is there a gene at any spot up or down where if we go across from individual to individual, the hair less or the less hairy leaves are red. So like here, and let me draw this out. So that would be a region where that individual has parent one's genotype and trait. And here we have an individual that has hairy leaves and is blue, like parent two. So, so far this is consistent with maybe there's a gene in that region of the chromosome that controls this trait. But then we get to individual three who's red at that part of the chromosome. And if they're red, if the gene that controls less hairs is in that part, they should have red. But in this case, this individual has lots of hairs. So we would predict if that gene is present there, that it would have to be the blue version of that gene. So in other words, that region of the genome is not what's controlling this trait. And so this is why we use computers to do these sorts of analyses, because it's complex. You can do this simply if there was a single locus that controls this trait. But the more genes might be involved, and we never know in advance how many genes control the trait. We have to assume that there could be hundreds of genes that control the trait. It's a very complicated and time-consuming process to go through all of the different combinations of each locus on each chromosome and each trait to try to find the best possible um, correlation between the phenotypes of the F8 hybrids and their genotypes. So here's one locus where things almost look good. So here, remember, red controls fewer hairs. Blue is going to control more hair. At locus one, not quantitative trait locus one, I should have written a Q. Individual is red, so I've encoded here the genotypes of the individuals at that spot, so it's easier to see. So what we're looking for again is correlation, red with fewer hairs and blue with more hairs. If we find a perfect correlation, that will suggest that that spot on that chromosome contains a gene that controls that trait. So what's not perfect here? Every time we see red, the individual has few hairs, except for that individual it has red at that location, but lots of hairs. Same there. 
and same there. So what's good about this is that the individuals that are hairy, some of them, do have that blue genotype. So that individual, that individual, and that individual. Their genotypes all correlate with their traits. So this is good, but we're not quite there yet because we don't have a perfect correlation between just one gene and the trait. If we did, this would be a simple trait. One gene controls the trait. In this example, this is a trait where the phenotype is controlled by two loci, not one. And in this case, if we add in the genotype a different part of the same chromosome, let's see what happens. An individual that has few hairs is red at both loci, or both of those genes or regions of the chromosome. And now, every time we have an individual that has few hairs, they are red, they have the red genotypes at both of these loci on this chromosome. So four individuals with few hairs, all four of them have the same combination of genotypes, red and red. Red and red, red and red. And that, again, is the genotype of parent one. They have their homozygous red at both of those loci. So, so far, this is perfectly compatible with the story. But now let's take a look at what's happening again at the first locus. We can see that individuals that have lots of hairs on their leaves can have a number of different genotypes. They can either be homozygous blue, they can be blue-blue, have two blue regions of the chromosome, or they can have one or the other blue. So here's an individual that has lots of hairs, blue at one locus, but red at the other. Here's an individual that has lots of hairs, blue at the second locus, red at the first. So this is one possible scenario for this sort of mapping of traits that are controlled by two or more genes, that a particular combination of genotypes will produce a trait. So we can imagine in this case that blue is, well, it's not dominant. It's maybe, oh, maybe I got myself into trouble. Maybe it's incompletely dominant, that it doesn't take two versions of the two genes. It doesn't take the blue versions of the two genes to make a fully hairy leaf. You can have one or the other. So you don't have to have both. So this is not an example of incomplete dominance. I shouldn't have said that. But the point I'm trying to get at is that it's an either or in this situation. It's sufficient to have one blue copy of one of these two genes to produce a hairy leaf. And if you have no blue, then you develop the less hairy So in a very simple sense, this is what happens in QTL mapping, except in QTL mapping, again, it's not just two traits, but a varying number of traits, and then doing the same computational approach, of looking at every possible pairwise combination of loci. So the top and the top of the bottom, the top and the bottom, the middle, the top of the bottom and the bottom, if there were just three loci on this chromosome, for example. And you have to do that for every chromosome and every combination of chromosomes. So if you're working in a species that has lots of chromosomes, there are lots more different combinations of traits that you have to consider computationally. And that's why we use computers to do QTL mapping. Well, ultimately, QTL mapping results in plots that look something like this, or they're usually displayed as something like this, where the y-axis is a statistical score of how likely it is that a trait a gene controlling a trait resides at that part of a chromosome. So the chromosomes are listed on the x-axis, the sequence coordinates of each chromosome from chromos sequence um, nucleotide one to the end of the chromosome for each, in this case, of 25 chromosomes. And the different chromosomes or different colors here represent these seven different cell layers that the authors were looking at the thicknesses of. And any time there's a peak that passes the log odds score, which is the dashed line, Anytime a peak passes that, 
on the y-axis indicates that there is likely a gene in that region underneath that peak, at that spot on that chromosome that controls whatever trait that is that's being measured. And in this case, the authors blow up, expand that part of the chromosome to show that peak, and then they blow that up even farther, magnify it farther to look at what are the genes that are present in that peak or underneath that peak on the chromosome. And so we'll see some familiar genes, or we will become familiar at some point, like CRX, the cone rod homeobox, which is a transcription factor that's specific to eye development. So that's a simple way of reading these QTL plots. Basically, we look for peaks that exceed a particular significance threshold. And then we look at the genes underneath those peaks as candidate genes that might be involved in regulating or producing the quantitative trait. In the paper that we're looking at presently, we have 24 different linkage groups. So in the previous slide, we looked at chromosomes arranged left to right on the x-axis. Here, they're talking about LGs or linkage groups. And again, in this plot, each of the blue boxes represents a QTL peak that has something to do with any of the traits they were looking at concerning eye development, eye size, and specifically the thicknesses of those different eye cell layers. So what's the difference between a linkage group and a chromosome? Because they essentially represent the same thing. So we know a chromosome is a physical piece of DNA, double helix, and it is continuous from telomere to telomere. So there's a particular DNA sequence of each chromosome. So I'm gonna write a short DNA sequence that doesn't correspond to the number of base pairs that I've drawn. So from one telomere to the next, we've got a, a chromosome that's six nucleotides long, which is definitely not a real chromosome. Now, presently, when scientists and genomicists identify the sequence of a chromosome, they don't necessarily get the full sequence of the chromosome from telomere to telomere in one piece. It's often the case that they will get stretches of sequence, and I'm going to make this really overtly un true, but they will get stretches of sequence, like they might get one piece of DNA that's AT and another one that's TC and maybe one that has all three. And they might get other pieces of sequence that are GT, TA, they might get another GT and they might get another TA. And so what the scientists do is they develop chromosome assemblies where they use, again, computers to line up all of these small pieces of DNA. They get short fragments of sequence of DNA from all of the chromosomes all at once, and they develop consensus sequences. And those become sequence scaffolds, they're called. And the sequence scaffolds produce a draft genome assembly. So what this means is each of these scaffolds will have a section of the sequence of the chromosome, but not the full sequence of the chromosome. And the reason in this case is because we didn't get any DNA sequences by chance that combined the two scaffolds. So if there had been a sequence that was TCG, that sort of information would have allowed the computational biologists to combine these two scaffolds because they could tell based on this sequence that, hey, there's a part of this sequence that's related to a part of this sequence. That means they should all be part of the same assembly of the chromosome sequence. But without that information, a chromosome sequence is represented by multiple scaffolds, as we see here. The chromosome sequence is represented on the top by one scaffold and on the bottom by a second sequence scaffold. So essentially what this means is that there can be more scaffolds, there are more sequence scaffolds than actual chromosomes, double helices. 
For our intents and purposes, we can, we'll also refer to scaffolds as linkage groups. That's not entirely accurate. So scaffolds are like linkage groups. Linkage groups are defined by geneticists based on an old school approach, genetic mapping, that indicates the genetic distances or relationships between nucleotides at different parts of the chromosome. So linkage groups are technically different than scaffolds, but it's the same concept, that there can be more linkage groups than chromosomes. And a linkage group and a scaffold each represent most of, or maybe even entirely, a chromosome. Ideally, then, of course, you get one scaffold or one linkage group per physical chromosome. So that's what a linkage group is. It's a part of a chromosome up to a full chromosome. At best, there's one linkage group per chromosome, and they represent the same thing. Now, finally, let's talk about pleiotropy. This is a concept that's brought up in this paper. And there are two different possibilities for why it is or how it is that cave dwelling organisms tend to lose both their eyes and pigment production at the same time, or maybe not at the same time, but at least in the same environments. So why is it that these two traits seem to correlate with each other, pigmentation and eye development? There could be two different possibilities. One would be that the genes in all of these different species that control eye development and pigment production are always located in the same region of the same chromosome, whichever chromosome, in all of these different, vastly different species, maybe there's always a deletion of that part of the chromosome, wherever it is, whichever chromosome it is, so that every time pigmentation is lost, it's because there's a deletion of one part of one chromosome that happens to contain all of the genes that control these apparently diverse set of traits like pigmentation and eye production. The other possibility, or at least the other major possibility, is related to the concept of pleiotropy, that a single gene controls multiple traits. So that if something happens to that gene, the scientist observes multiple changes that can appear unrelated to each other, but they are related to each other because those traits are unbeknownst to the scientist controlled by the same gene. So if there was a single gene that controls both pigmentation and eye development, if a mutation happens, then that could cause a change to multiple traits, two or more, at the same time. And that's the concept of pleiotropy. And in this case, it is particularly relevant to note, for example, that hedgehog, which we abbreviate HH, is involved in positively regulating uh, constructive traits like um, feeding structures, which might be useful for these fish in cave environments. And it's also true that hedgehog negatively regulates eye development. So, what if, just as an example, this is not necessarily true, but what if a fish population migrates into a cave and they evolve over there for many generations and they both need to evolve structures that help them sense their environment physically, touch, better, and they don't really need eye development either. A single mutation to hedgehog maybe could help it both create new feeding structures at the same time while also causing at the same time the loss of eye development. That would be a concept of pleiotropy. One gene and a change in one gene having effects on multiple traits that maybe don't seem like they're related to each other, but they are actually genetically related to each other because they're under the control of the same gene. So pleiotropy often has to do with changes in, as you might expect now, things like transcription factors or genes that are part of signaling cascades, where if you change an upstream component of that cascade, it will have multiple downstream effects. And in this example, I've mentioned eye development and constructive structures, but it could be just as likely that a transcription factor or some other factor could have pleiotropic functions that regulate both eye development and also pigment production. 